Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for episode six of Anatomy of Tone. In this week's podcast, we're going to discuss some tips for any musicians or songwriters who are preparing to put a band together for a gig. And I give some tips from my own experiences and observations of how to organize assets such as like MP3s or charts or how to deal with communication and just to make things as clear and straightforward as possible to bring the most out of the musicians that you're working with as opposed to leaving them confused or having to work harder on the the business and organization side of it as opposed to really getting into the nuance of the music. I'm also going to discuss what I like to call the rhythmic compass, which has to do with always having a concept of where you are in time at any given moment while playing music, meaning counting beats, counting measures. I just want to look at how this has changed and improved my playing and what it really means to live in this mindset. And lastly, I'm going to do an overview of the Surfy Bear Metal Analog Spring Reverb. This has turned into one of my all-time favorite pedals and it's pretty much the best thing that you can get for capturing that surf spring reverb sound, but I could do a lot more, so I'm gonna dig into that. Let's jump right in. I've been working as a session musician doing gigs in recording sessions for a number of years now, and I've had a pretty wide range of experiences. I thought I would share a few of my, I don't know, observations over the years about getting organized for a gig as a band leader. So if you're a songwriter and you're hiring a band or you're getting a bunch of people together to play on your gig, I just want to share a few tips that uh, I think I've come to really appreciate when organizing and preparing for a show. If you have made some of the mistakes I'm about to mention, don't fret about it. We're all trying to learn and there isn't really a great resource for learning this stuff aside from you just getting out there and doing it. So my hope is to empower you to make it a better experience for you to have better gigs to get more out of your rehearsals and rather than uh, just run into some of the roadblocks and, and difficulties that I've experienced both as a band leader and as a side musician. So of course I've made these mistakes as well because when I came up, as I mentioned, there isn't really a book on this and it seems like it would be a good topic to be able to study for aspiring composers and songwriters. Let's start off by talking about organizing our materials material to give to musicians. It's really important to be uniform about your delivery system. So first of all, I make sure that all the files are the same type. I don't want a mix of MP3s and waves or any other kind of forms. So just make sure everything is MP3 because it's a smaller file. So if people are trying to download on their phone or whatever device, it's just less data. Secondly, I think it's important to be very consistent with your naming process. So don't put numbers in front unless it's part of the song. I've seen sometimes files that will be like 01 song title and then another one won't be. Uh, just make sure that you're creating and even labeling and organizing files specifically for the gig. So I don't pull these from my iTunes library or whatever. I actually copy them into a new folder on my hard drive labeled for gigs. And then in that folder, that's only where these copies of the audio files that you're going to use for the show are going to exist. And that way you can go through and do some specific labeling. The thing is, if you have a song that maybe used to have a different name, make sure the name is updated. Don't send musicians a, a file that's named one name and then they get to rehearsal and there's a different name of on the set list. Or if you start corresponding in emails, you're referring to the new title. All this stuff could get confusing. And the point is just to make it a straight shot as much as you can, just clarity. Back on the topic of file type, never send a file that is one condensed file with every song in it. So I've in the past gotten a few files to be like, here was our last show and they just send one MP3 and there's no timestamps on it of what song starts when. It makes it very, very difficult and time consuming to work through a track and mark and maybe write down, okay, the third song starts at 8, 11, you know. Uh, it just takes away from being able to get into the nuance of playing the song if I'm spending time trying to just navigate where the song starts. The same thing goes for YouTube links and online streaming links. Don't do it. Just always send a physical file. Uh, I've had people send me also one full length file on YouTube, again, with no timestamps that I've had to go through because I wasn't familiar with material. I'd have to guess what song was what. 
And assuming that that was the set list, then I showed up to the dress rehearsal and that wasn't actually the set order. So uh, again, just confusion and uh, it takes time that I have to rearrange my charts. I have to rethink the transitions. So just physical files because musicians also like to download them into programs. I use a program called Transcribe, which allows me to slow down or speed up audio files. Sometimes I might want to play an audio file really fast just to double check the form. Sometimes I might want to slow it down just to hear a little bit of nuance in it, especially if you're not sending charts. I might want to dig in a little deeper and hear more detail. So sending a YouTube link makes it very difficult. Or if you send me a link that's to a streaming audio file on your website or Spotify, it just isn't helpful for really being able to get in and do detailed learning. I use Dropbox to store my files in that I give to musicians for gigs. You can use WeTransfer, and there's a bunch of different ones now. I think it doesn't matter too much which one you use, but just make sure it's one that it's easily accessible for the musicians and you don't have a lot of restrictions on it. I've had issues with Google Drive where I was signed into a different email or whatever and I couldn't get access to it. And if you can, it's never a bad idea to have charts for your songs, but I do recommend that you make sure that you have good charts. Hire somebody to make what would be industry standard looking charts, meaning don't scratch out your own language for a chart. I've gotten some pretty interesting charts over the years from people. And, and honestly, a lot of times those weird non-formatted scribbled out charts don't work. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be a master chart maker or that there's anything wrong with you making the charts any way you want for yourself to reference as you're being creative. You could use symbols. You could do anything you want for yourself as you're learning songs. But when you have to share it with other people, there's a lot of musicians that know how to read standardized music. It's good to have charts of that fashion ready to go because this also saves musicians time. You might be wondering why is it so important to save musicians time? And that is because musicians are often scrambling to make ends meet. I know it's costing the artist what they consider to be a lot of money for I'm sure the amount of money that they're making. But in the big picture, it's not really a lot of money to survive most of the time. So musicians are tr stretched pretty thin in order to make ends meet. So that means the time that they're able to put into each gig is some somewhat limited just because of this need to survive. So the more that they're researching, looking up songs, doing any of that stuff, the more it's taking away from them actually digging into the music and the more likely that they're going to show up to the rehearsal and not having played it much and just prepared everything, but probably playing it through the first or, or only the second time on a rehearsal. But by having charts prepared or just by having everything labeled correctly and in individual files, you're helping them get themselves into a position to, to prepare so they can get into the playing faster. And that's where having charts is also very helpful. Now, you could get as specific as you want with the charts. It depends on how specific you are about parts. If you're really specific about the parts, like you did a record and you want those parts to be represented, it's a great idea to have some charts made. Now, I've done this a lot from when I have musical directed gigs for various people. I have musical directed gigs for Abby Ahmed and Jan Nichols and a number of different artists who are doing their CD release and I had to recreate the record. So what I did is I wrote out the parts that were important and then there were other songs or parts that looked more like a traditional lead sheet. You can kind of like pave the way for them. Let them know what's important to you because they're not psychic. And sometimes when musicians are listening to a record, they're trying to guess what you think is the most important part. And sometimes we guess wrong because there's multiple layers to choose from. By making a roadmap, it can also just send them in a direction and allow them to get into the actual nuances of playing the parts. Now, for songs that don't have a lot of specific parts on them, you can just make a very basic lead sheet, which basically just marks out the time signatures and the form of the song and the basic chords. Sending emails is a really important thing when it comes to communicating with the musicians that you're hiring for a session or a gig. Uh, and again, this applies for a recording session, not just gigs or right? anytime you're hiring musicians. I've gotten a, a lot of variety of uh, messy emails over the years. Uh, one thing I will say is that you should have one email with the name of the gig on it, the date. So the title of the email will be June 25th at Pete's Candy Store. And within this email, I'm going to list all the information that the musicians would need in one place. So this way they can search in the email to find 
the info about the gig. In the body of the email, I'm going to have the address of the venue, the time that we load in and when sound check is, the time of each rehearsal and the location of each rehearsal. And from there, I'm also going to include a set list. It'd be great if you have the set list ready, even if you just have a song list that's helpful. But a set list would be even more optimal. And then there's going to be a link below that. That's going to be the Dropbox or however you're using to distribute the physical, or the actual files for the songs. And then from below there, it's going to have my notes. And the notes I like to separate by instrument. So it might be drums. And then I might go through the set list and pick out something that I might want to mention. Like, hey, song three, I really actually would prefer to try a tom-tom groove on this song. Okay, let them know that. Uh, and just go through every song. And if you don't have any notes on a song, you don't have to put it in there. But this is the place where you'll put in any kind of directions you want to give to the drummer before the first rehearsal. So I would go through the bass player next and do the same thing. I would go through the guitar player, background singers, or keyboard players. This way, they each have their own sections so they can scan through the email, find it, check their notes. Sometimes I've gotten notes from people where they're just interspersed with other musicians and, and it's really kind of hard and I would end up missing things. Like my eyes just didn't catch something that was connected to something they were talking about the drummer with, right? But having sections just makes it clear. And the same thing after each rehearsal. You just make sure that the emails are all labeled and dated so you know what they are. Again, if there's any rehearsal recordings that you did, separate them, label them properly, put them in a Dropbox folder, and then your email should also follow a very similar format with uh, with each instrument and, and the directions for the next rehearsal or preparations for the gig. If you've done this, you're going to show up to rehearsal and you're going to notice things are going to move a lot more smoothly than you had anticipated. And this is important because often rehearsal time is somewhat limited. A lot of people these days aren't rehearsing multiple times for uh, a gig. It's one, two times max, and then you have to pull it off. So uh, it, the more prepared everybody can be walking in that room and not learning thing at the, 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 that moment, it's just going to be a lot more fun for everybody and everybody's going to just gel a lot sooner. The last thing I'd like to mention is when it comes to payment after the gig, make sure you're clear with the musicians about how and when you're going to pay them. Don't make them hunt you down after the gig. I've been on some gigs where the artist just seems to disappear after we get off stage and they're socializing with everybody, which is perfect because that's exactly what you want them to do and get people to buy their CDs or merch or come to more shows or get them excited about the music. However, it can be problematic as a musician because sometimes musicians are doing two, three gigs a night and they have to move around and get to the next gig. And if you haven't discussed how you're going to pay them or when, then and they're searching for you and then they're getting stressed out because of their next obligation and they're starting to feel a little resentful. So at the rehearsal, I will always mention to people, okay, here's what I'm going to do after the gig. I'm going to Venmo everybody the next day or I will have checks as soon as we arrive at the gig or you could Venmo people as soon as everybody gets to the gig. The key here is either do it before the gig or the day after the gig. It's really hard to pay people as you're getting off stage. So most musicians are cool with being paid the next day as long as you're clear with it. Don't tell them after the gig you're going to do that. Make a mention before and rehearsal is the best time for this. So you see really a lot of what I'm talking about is communication. The more communicative and organized you can be with your musicians, the better you're going to get out of their performances. A lot of students that come to me are looking to tighten up their rhythm chops, meaning that they could play, but often they find that their rhythm is out of time or they're lost in the music. I think this is a common thing because a lot of people learn music by feel and they often aren't counting while they're playing. And, you know, it's debatable how much music theory you need to know to make music. I mean, you can just listen and only play by ear. And this works great if you're practicing a lot with a band and you're playing things exactly from night to night. You don't need to make a lot of in-the-moment decision-making and change things up. The minute that you want to learn music faster or have more tools to be able to remember music or to play tighter to a click track, you want to be able to improvise and have more options and to sync up with musicians better, 
it becomes really important to have a good control over your counting and know where you are all the time, essentially like a rhythmic compass. A lot of players that come to me, and if I ask them to count while they're soloing, they can't do it. And they don't know where they are in the bar when they're soloing either. So if I said, okay, solo for four bars, but then on end on beat three, they would have problems doing that. This is because they haven't spent a lot of time counting out loud and making sure that they're on some sort of grid. So I'm not suggesting this to make your music mechanical. Counting and having good rhythm doesn't have anything to do with your playing becoming mechanical. It's just another way that you can gain control over your playing. Now, counting has allowed me to learn songs faster because for me, I'm visually stimulated. So I actually will see what the rhythms would look like written out on paper. That's just another way in my brain that I can try to recall a riff if I don't know it very well. So sometimes I'd be on a gig and in sound check, the artist would decide to learn a new song and I'd have to have the song with no chart on stage, I have to have down by the time we performed, which wasn't that long after the sound check. One of the ways I did this was to visualize the rhythm and that would help bring it back. And in my mind, I'd visualize the rhythm and where the chord was on top of each part of the rhythm. So uh, it, it was almost like I was seeing it written down on paper in my imagination. Because I've spent a lot of time practicing counting, I was able to remember where breaks would be or what beats had accents on them. This takes some time to harness. It's tricky because because your mind is going to want to hit the panic button and just stop counting and give up and be like, I'm lost. And you're going to get lost for a while. But I encourage you to persist and to keep counting. Let me give some examples. Okay, so if I'm just playing, let's just say I'm, I'm soloing a little bit in G major here. So I'm going to count the lowest common denominator, meaning the fastest I'm going to play. So I'm going to play some eighth notes in this, which uh, means that I'm going to count one and two and three and four. And as I'm playing, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one, two and three and four and one and two and three, four and one and two and three and four and one, two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. It was all eighth notes. If you remember from my previous podcast that I mentioned about playing on the strong beats, there's no way to have a good sense of where beats one and three are if you're not using your rhythmic compass. Because I was, if you, even though I had no chords backing me up there, there was some sort of harmonic outline in what I was playing because where I was stressing the notes of the G major scale. This time I'm going to use 16th notes to do that. So I count one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a, let's stick to G major. I'm only going to play over that one chord, G major. One of the things I also like to do is I just want to limit my scope when I'm learning new things. I don't want to tack on like also having to remember where the chords change. Or so just using one chord for this example to practice our rhythmic compass is important. And so we don't have to multitask. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. You'll notice that I was counting all the time, but I wasn't always playing the guitar. So I want to be counting the lowest common denominator, as I mentioned. It's the fastest subdivision that we're going to use. And I'm going to keep saying it out loud, and that way I can drop in and drop out, almost like a needle dropping down on a, on a record, whenever I need to, and I know I'm going to be locked into the grid, the time of the song. So if somebody says to you, okay, well, bar three, we're going to land on the N of one, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a three E and a... And you'll notice that I was versioning the bar. So I said one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a three E and... That way I also have a system for keeping track of what bar I'm playing. So if if we applied this to a blues and E, one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one. 
How I would suggest approaching this is taking very small snippets, maybe just one measure of music and counting it out, but extremely slow. I always encourage my students to play things almost at a ridiculously slow speed where it feels so exaggerated that it's almost comical. If you can play things really slowly and have control over them, you will have control over them as you speed them up. But what's interesting is it doesn't always work the other way. So just because you can play things fast doesn't actually mean you can play them slowly. And sometimes when we're playing it fast, we kind of slop it together and it's rickety, but it kind of works. Uh, when we slow it down, it really exposes how good we are at counting things. So I would play it really slow and just try to count everything you're doing. Start out with quarter notes even. One, two, three. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. I was just walking through arpeggio notes, like a major seventh chord, G major seventh chord. So you could pick a very simple task to practice it on. But what you really want is at any given moment, you should be able to jump in and know exactly where you are in the measure what beat you're on, what the subdivision is. Every time I start a song, before I just jump in the song, the song is being cut off, I always make sure I know what the, the lowest common denominator is, right? What's the subdivision? I don't wait till beat one to figure that out. I want to get acclimated. So if somebody's going, okay, here's the beginning of the song. One, two, three, four. For that count off, if the song is stuff like this, one, two, two. I'm, I want to make sure I get that triplet feel in my mind. One, two, and three, and four. And that way, when we jump in, I know I'm locked into the feel. I get a good sense of what's happening. And that way, I know where beat one is, beat two is, and the subdivision is triplets, right? So do that with every song. That way, on beat one, you land, and you're settled, and you're grounded, right? Being able to count well is going to solve so many of your rhythmic problems. Not only is it going to tighten up your playing, it'll allow you to play with a metronome better, and it'll allow you to then look at your hand technique and consider what might be tripping up your timing there. But it's really hard to do this without a sense of counting rhythm or to have this rhythmic compass, as I was saying. This week we're going to check out the Surfy Bear Metal, which is a real analog spring reverb that is based on the Fender 6G15 tube reverb unit. And they've recreated the sound without using tubes, which is pretty amazing. I've compared it to some reissue 6G15 reverbs, and I prefer the Surfy Bear Metal, which is crazy to say and almost never happens with um with gear that's meant to imply old gear so they've really done a spectacular job designing this surfy bear metal it's a fairly large pedal which makes sense when you consider that it's using real springs on the inside uh, there are some pedals and actually surfy bear does make a smaller one with springs which i haven't tried but i've tried some springs from a couple other companies that are in smaller enclosures and they just don't sound right the demeter reverberator is actually a really great spring reverb that is a little smaller than the Surfy Bear, but it doesn't really sound like the 6G15 circuit. It has a little bit more of a sweeter, kind of refined sound. It doesn't have that crashing wave sound as much. So I use the Demeter a lot in the studio, uh, but for like my surf gigs and the surf sound, the Surfy Bear metal is kind of where it's at. I've been looking for a great spring reverb for a number of years, and it's just always been a challenge. Uh, I tried the Anna Sounds with the multiple reverb tanks, and I would have to say that was my least favorite of all the spring reverbs I've tried. I just really think that's uh, not a very good sounding reverb. There's reliability issues with it. Uh, I just the the uh, some of the settings on it were utterly useless. And uh, I, I did not hang on to that pedal very long. I was very disappointed with it. Initially, I was excited because you could mount the spring underneath your pedal board and then just be able to turn it on and off the switch above. So it seemed very appealing. And plus, you could choose from a couple of different springs. But honestly, it just it sounded um, flat and it didn't really have any of the excitement that the Surfy Bear Metal does. So uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that one at all. Uh, the Demeter is its own thing and is a really high quality quality product. So it's not so much about the Surfy Bear being better than the Demeter Reverberator. It's more about its its own thing. Now I did have a valve train tube reverb. I think it was called the spring thing. 
for a while. And that was okay, but it was a little noisy. And I would say that the reverb tank wasn't big enough in it. So it didn't quite have that dig Dale wash to it. And that was something I always wanted. I kept holding on to the valve train thinking, you know, eventually it was going to be the right tool for me, but it never was. So I got rid of that. And then when I discovered the surfy bear, pretty much at a point where I thought like, okay, I'm not going to get that, that Dick Dale spring reverb sound in a, in a pedal or in a transportable manner, aside from buying an old 615, uh, I, I was completely blown away because man, it's amazing. Uh, let's check out some of the features in it. I'm going to play some audio examples. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about surf music in, in this overview of the surf band metal because a reverb is so, or especially spring reverb in particular, is so associated with that genre. Now, even though early surf records, some of them didn't have reverb on them, pretty quickly reverb did become very associated with uh, surf music. And not everybody used the the uh, the Fender 615. Hank Marvin from The Shadows used the Benson Echo Rec for a while and the Echoplexes and a couple other things. And they were on the other side of the pond in the UK and they were using Vox Amps also, which is another interesting pairing for uh, for what we consider to be the surf music sound. Uh, I love the shadows, and I recommend checking out Hank's arguably one of the greatest guitar players of that genre. Well, I don't even think it's arguable. I think he's phenomenal. The American surf sound is mostly a tube spring reverb Fender into a Fender Brown panel amplifier or a tweed. The black panel amplifiers did not come out at the height of surf. They came out around the time that surf was starting to diminish because of the British invasion. So those sounds more associated bands like the Beach Boys, although there were still from some brown panel amps being used on those records, that somehow the Twin Reverb and the Deluxe Reverb get associated with surf music because they have reverb on them, but weren't really on a lot of the classic recordings from the Ventures and the Shantays and a bunch of the other surf bands that we come to reference within that genre. There is something about the, I don't know, um, roundness of the brown panel amps from Fender that are have a sweetness to them and a very specific type of breakup. Not only do some of them have different tremolos and uh, bias, and some of them have harmonic tremolo, which I will talk about in a future episode, uh, but also it's just they, um, they're sort of a, a, a great medium amp between the tweed era of amps and the black panel amps, which the black panel amps are a little more mid-scooped, and the surf music has, has got some mids in it. It's, it's very round and has some nice mid-range in it. So really, the one of the greatest pairings you could you could use is a, is a tweed and a, and a great spring reverb like the Surfing Bear Metal or uh, a brown panel um, Fender style amp. Now there's not a lot of people making the brown panel style amps now, but Headstrong Amps does make that circuit. If you're really serious about capturing that surf tone, I recommend checking out the Headstrongs because uh, not only does he make fabulous black panel amps, but the the brown panel amps are, are killer as well. The Surfy Band Metal also happens to have a pretty low noise floor, which has always been an issue for me with the external reverbs. I had a Van Amp Soulmate for a while, which I really liked the sound of. They went out of business, but it was a really great sounding reverb. However, it was pretty noisy and I did have some reliability issues and I even sent it back to them to have it repaired and they couldn't find the problem and they sent it back and it would work and not work. And although I liked the tone of it, it was just not a very reliable pedal and noisy. So when I plugged in the Surfy Bear and noticed that it was pretty low in its noise, it was very uh, optimistic because noise is just becoming more and more of an issue. As we all know, there's more RF interference and there's Wi-Fi and so many things that uh, that can then show up in our signal. So anything these days that doesn't add any noise to my signal, uh, I'm really excited about. Let's listen to an example of me using a Stratocaster with FSC 59 scatter round, hand round pickups in it, run into the Surfy Bear Metal, run into a Victoria 35 115. Now this is the Tweed Pro Circuit, so it's a 15 inch speaker. It's a really lovely Tweed circuit that doesn't get enough attention. <laughs>
spring reverbs you tend to get a drop in volume as you turn up the mix knob and make it more wet and this is problematic because sometimes on stage it just feels like you're losing signal and your amp isn't being driven as hard but the surfy bear has a volume knob on it that allows you to really juice your signal going to the amp so if you want to keep your gain staging hot because you're pushing the front end of the amp and actually an example you start to hear the 35 115 start to drive a little bit because i'm pushing the volume knob on the surf repair into the amp to get a little bit of that stain and, and gentle compression happening. I'm going to play a rhythmic guitar line with the same signal chain, but I'm really going to juice the springs on this one so you could hear them crashing a lot with a rhythmic part. <laughs> You could really hear the crashiness, the waviness of it. The Surfy Bear also has a tone knob on it, which allows you to control a bit of your perception of how much, how many of those like waves are, or, or I should say, how rocky the water is, right? How how strong the waves are by reducing the treble on it, or using the tone knob. It softens the tone and, and allows you to get more of a bit of a mellow sound. For instance, let's listen to this example of me using a 335 into a headstrong Little King, but I'm using the Surfy Bear reverb instead of the onboard reverb from the Little King. <laughs> It's a much more subtle reverb in that case. It's filling in some space in the background and just bubbling back there and, and adding some dimension, but it's not really like as aggressive and taking up as much of the foreground. Let's listen to another subtle use of the Surfy Bear Metal. I'm going to use a Vox AC-15 with this example, and we're still going to use the Stratocaster with the FSC-59 pickups in it. <laughs> we can tell already that the surfy bear metal isn't a one trick pony it can do the crashy wavy thing which nothing else seems to really authentically be able to do and it can also sit in a mix and be more subtle and just fill out the space so things aren't so dry as nicely but not be a, a wallflower at the same time right i feel like that's the issue with some reverbs is that you can get them to sit in the background but they really don't add anything i guess they fill the space so it doesn't feel so dry, but it also isn't inspiring or exciting in any way. So I feel like the Surfy Bear does that even when it's being used as a subtle reverb. Let's try it with a heavier sound. So I'm going to use a Gibson SG Custom with Gemini Mercury One pickups in it. I'm going to run that into an Analog Man BC-108 Sunface, which is the silicone version of a fuzz face circuit. That's going to run into the Surfy Bear Metal. And then that's going to run into a Marshall SV20H Plexi with a Celestian Vintage 30s. <laughs> Let's 
listen to an example that maybe gets a little more weird. I'm using the same signal chain, SG, Sunface, BC-108, Surfy Bear, Marshall Plexi. So the only thing that is different is the playing and the changes to the settings on the Surfy Bear. The Surfy Bear also has a mix knob and a dwell knob. So mix knob, just how much reverb is in your signal. Dwell knob, adjust the length of the reverb. So all the way up and clockwise, you're going to get a very long spring sound. But lower, you're going to get like a shorter spring sound, which could kind of be closer to like a shorter decay room sound. But of course, it doesn't sound like a room because it's springs. So the low settings are nice for just getting a little bit of air in your sound so it's not completely dry. And it's what you heard me doing more with the fuzz guitar track that we just heard and actually the uh, the 335 example as well with the dwell knob lower than on, say, the uh, the really crashy Stratocaster version. <laughs> hear how the springs are being activated by the guitar and the spring reverb it creates these cool overtones that you just wouldn't get from any other reverb let's listen to some examples using synthesizers now i'm going to start with a dave smith ob6 synthesizer and that's going to run into the surfy bear it's an analog synthesizer i'm running straight into the surfy bear into api 312 preamps into a purple audio mc77 compressor now i really love synthesizers through spring reverbs it gets particularly fun like when you use filters and as you open up the filter the brighter signal hits the spring reverbs in a specific way and excites them and you get like this crashy kind of sound going up and if you cut the filter then it drops off but you still hear the reverb crashing in the distance it's just really fun it's almost like you set off waves right it's like it's like jumping into a pool and then watching the waves continue down the pool let's check it out Now I'm going to use a Sequential Circuits Profit 10 analog synth into the Surfy Bear. I'm going to use an arpeggiator to hear how that interacts with the Surfy Bear. example, I was manually riding the filter on the Prophet 10 so that I can bring it up and bring it down to give an example of what I was talking about just before about how when the filter's up, the brightness of the synthesizer hits the Surfy Bear metal in a specific way and then you bring the filter down and you still hear that treble bitey sound carrying through and crashing on. Running bass or synth bass through spring reverb can also be very exciting. So in this example, I'm going to use the Prophet 10 again, but I'm using a bass patch here. You're going to hear it triggering the spring reverb in really interesting ways where you're getting surprising overtones, which I think is really great for film and sound design work.
I'm a huge fan of the Twilight Zone and the compositions that were used in it. Uh, composers such as Bernard Herrmann and Jerry Goldsmith had composed and a lot of Bernard's library music was used in the Twilight Zone as well as some other composers. And a lot of the inspiration for that music was 20th century harmony and Stravinsky and Charles Ives and uh, Bartok. I wanted to do an example using the vibraphone uh, from a Mellotron M4000D Mini run into the Surfy Bear to get more of that 1950s vibe of um of I don't know that graininess right and spookiness that, that a lot of those episodes had. Let's check it out. such a retro sound and it's just the pairing of the Mellotron with the Surfy Bear is just kind of really sublime. I use those two in combination a lot. In fact, I also have the Surfy Bear set up so that I can tie it into my rack unit for recording and mixing. I do take it to gigs and use it, but I also can patch it in because it also sounds really cool on vocals and a number of different instruments, you know, muted pick bass. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, sources that you'd be surprised that Spring Reverb actually sounds really awesome on surprisingly sometimes on a snare drum or something you know it's like think of it as as it being a, a, a special effect in scenarios where you wouldn't normally use a spring reverb and there's not like great plugins that do this i've tried a number of them and again i feel it's the same way with the pedals as it is with uh with plugins it, it's just a really hard sound to emulate i think because of just the i don't know the randomness of of how some of the overtones happen and and how much of it is an interaction with the reverbs the springs themselves to get that sound so uh, it, it you know it's not that people aren't trying i think it's just a really difficult thing to properly emulate for that reason i'm still using a real spring reverb and the surfy bear metal i think is my all-time favorite spring reverb of any vintage one or anything which is cool to say that in modern times somebody's making something I think is is probably one of the, the coolest reverb units ever made. That's all for this week's episode of Anatomy of Tone. I hope you'll join me next week for some new sonic explorations and discussions on music. If you can, please write a review and subscribe to my channel. It would help me out. And if anybody's interested in conversing more on lessons or gear or scoring or composing, you can reach me at anatomyofguitartone.com. That's my contact page. If you have any topics that you would like to have covered in future episodes, please send me a line. I'm going to leave you with a song that I composed that in my mind I meant to try to embody the sound of a lazy early summer day that's kind of dreamy, slightly melancholy for previous seasons that you've experienced, but also just living in the casualty of that day. I played all the instruments on it and arranged everything. The strings are done with a Mellotron and everything else is uh, real instruments and there were no um, samples used in this.
Thank you.